a revolution digest where businesses get smarter. I'm Jesslyn. And I'm Elias. Together, we show you how AI drives real results. And because the future isn't waiting, let's dive right in. What happens when AI steps into the boardroom and rewrites the rules for leadership? That is the question for today's episode. And now let's welcome our guest speaker for today, Professor Nyberg. Professor, thank you for being here. Can you tell our listeners who are you and what you do? Thank you for having me on your podcast. I'm quite excited to be here. I'm a research professor here at the Darla Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina. I've been here since uh, 2008 after a, a career in the financial services area. And my research is mostly regarding how organizations compete through people, often with a compensation and or turnover uh, component to it. And over the last couple of years, like many, I've been spending a lot of time both researching AI and how it will influence uh, productivity in the workforce, as well as engaging with a lot of com uh, in conversations with a number of C-suite people, including uh, CHROs, CEOs, CFOs, and directors of some of the largest organizations in the world. Thank you, Professor. Now you talk about CEO, C-suites, and so how do, in what way can you use AI to identify high-performing talent? So if we're just talking about AI and high performers throughout the organization, uh, certainly AI is going to help us be able to do a much better job of getting more immediate feedback. It also ought to be able to help us create more uh, closely linked development plans linked to both the career aspirations of the employee and of what's strategically valuable to the organization. And I think that there'll also be an opportunity for us to create better customized compensation plans such that individuals will be able to be rewarded in ways that are in line with the organization's goals as well as with their own personal goals at their, that are appropriate for their time in life. And what's the limitations of that? So like everything, um, there's always the question of bias. And we are a function of the data that goes into whatever we're using for AI is going to affect what comes out, which includes uh, prior, prior preconceived ideas that are already in the organization. There's also a big challenge that we're going to face in terms of an over-reliance on AI, um, in terms of particularly how we learn to make decisions. So as people become more comfortable with AI helping in the decision-making process, that will be super beneficial. But when we cross over and we're relying on it too much, it's quite possible to just make us dumber. And then there's, of course, a lot of privacy concerns. Uh, as AI is able to grab more and more data, like if we were to scrape people's emails or internal communications as a means for understanding how people are really performing in a number of different er areas, there is a, a, a potential there for a great overreach. Well, so the uh, key to getting employees to really trusting this system will involve transparency from the top. Transparency in terms of how much AI is being used, as well as when it's being used and what the mechanisms will be uh, to ensure that there is some sort of human judgment that's ultimately taking responsibility. Okay, thank you, Professor. So I just want to go back to your point. You said that AI, when we become over-reliant on it, is, is going to make us dumber. Right, that's what you said. So, and you also stated the point that AI can reinforce certain biases when identifying those top talents. So, I want to ask, what are those biases in the first place? Well, we all have them in internally and inherent to us, right? So, we, for instance, we tend to think that people are performing better when they perform more similar to us. Just as a quick example, I'm someone who likes to come in the office every day. I'm in here every day. Today happens to be Monday of Thanksgiving week. Not surprisingly, there are not very many people out there. My immediate bias is to think that I'm working harder than others. If we allow those kind of uh, biases that are already intrinsic to us as humans to filter through whatever is occurring in AI, 
we're going to end up with the same sort of problems that we have with humans. You know, AI isn't just a magic, a magic uh, solution to any of these kind of issues. Yeah, so I think we've talked about the privacy considerations in terms of data overreach and what might be out there from uh, uh, AI being able to mine kind of everything that's out on, and online or that we're using even internal to the organization. So we certainly need to let employees understand where, uh, where we're going to be pulling data and when we're going to be using it and how we're going to be using it. Uh, from an ethical perspective, at least for now, as long as we believe in humans and, and they're not ready to just turn the world over to machines, we also want to make sure that humans have ultimate responsibility and are leading the way in terms of decisions so that we're using AI as a tool to help us get where we want our organizations to go, but we're not relying on it entirely. And this comes back to um, humans having ultimate responsibility for the decisions that are there. Thank you, Professor, and I totally agree with your points. And our last speakers were always going to tell us one of the things that AI would never replace is people's leadership skills and their intuition. And talking about leadership, imagine that you're dealing with the next CEOs or people who are preparing to be CEOs and the amount of office politics that we'll be facing is, is a lot. So what's your advice for undergrads like Elias and I, who's going to graduate and go to the real world and see real <laughs> office politics? What is your advice for people like us? Yeah, well, my advice in general is to embrace it working and just work extremely diligently and be all in on whatever you're doing, whether that's in an office or anything else. Because at, when we engage at our fullest, 100% effort, we both get the most out of it and, and most of the time we find that to be the most enjoying. In terms of office politics, I say just ignore it. It's, it's, it gets a lot more play, the idea of office politics, than I think we really see playing out in part because when it plays out, it's quite ugly and unimaginable in terms of why it's going the way it's going. But in general, those that work the hardest, bring the most to the organization's success, are going to rise through the organization over time. So I suggest just get your work done and learn and embrace your opportunities and your challenges as much as possible. And if you find a place that's really heavily political, um, then I'd say leave, find a new one. What's your favorite holiday tradition? None of them. <laughs> if you could relieve one day in your life, which one would it be? Uh, at the moment, it's a, a day when I was 17. What happened? <laughs> what happened uh, that, won't, that takes much longer than one minute. <laughs> okay. What's the strangest dream you've ever had? Uh, I don't dream very much. Oh, really? You didn't even dream about being an HR professor? No, definitely not. Okay. <laughs> What's your go-to comfort food? Pizza. If you could be any fictional creature, which one would you be? Fictional creature? Yeah. I can't imagine doing anything other than what I'm doing now. So <laughs> okay. I'd stay right here. If you could only listen to one song forever, what would it be? That's an impossible one for me to answer. <laughs> out of out of ignorance, not out of anything else. Okay. What's a conspiracy theory you find funny? I find almost all conspiracy fun theories hysterical. What was your first? But mostly scary as hell. So they oh, terrify okay. me. Thank you, Professor, once again for being here. Before you leave, where can people reach out to you? Is there any projects that you would want to promote? Um. I, I, people can find much of our more recent research at the uh, online at looking for the Center for Executive Succession. So it's CES, Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina. Thank you, Professor. And to our listeners, if you want to be the next CEO, you know where to go to. Thank you, everyone, for listening and see you on our next episode. Goodbye.